You're rolling. Please direct your attention to our presenters. It's Kendar. Get the heck up here. No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so our independent lab was on the effects of expressed musical emotion on the physical aspects aspects of sound. Okay, and so the field that this is in is music cognition, which is basically the study of how the physical and mental processes uh, relate to the perception of sound and music. Yeah, so this was a, um, the picture is just a sample of something that a music cognition project or research would be about. So. This is just an example, and it shows what areas of the brain um, interpret the different musical aspects. Okay, so the question that we were investigating was how do the physical aspects of the music portray the emotion? Okay, so um, the like musicians are trained to express certain emotions in what they're playing, but they often don't know, like it's relatively unknown what um, physical aspects of the sound are making the emotion be perceived. Okay, so the way we did this project... Wait a second, we had those two things. Oh, right yeah, we did. Okay, so these are just two samples, and in our project we recorded one happy and one sad, or um, a bunch of happy and a bunch of sad versions of songs, so this is just an example of each of them. <laughs> So we recorded both of these, and then... Okay, so how we analyzed it after we recorded is we had to find each note using a computer program and analyze each individual note for the different features that we tested. And those were things like frequency range, highest frequency, duration of the note, longest excursion, which we'll explain later, intensity, stuff like that. And then... Uh, I guess we'll explain the rest of this later too, like the discriminant analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last two are just ways that we figured out which features were the most important in music. Okay, so the first thing that we found um, to be important in the different emotions was the duration, and it's pretty self-explanatory. It's just um, in the computer program, we just highlighted each of the notes and found the length, and then we compared them. Um, we compared the notes in the happy version to the notes in the sad version. And we were expecting the happy version to have um, shorter notes, just because it's more energetic and stuff, whatever. But um, it actually turned out that the happy, um, the happy samples had a lot longer note duration than the sad ones. Okay, so these were graphs of frequency range. And um, yeah, this is also a graph of sound pressure versus time. And um, so the sound range, uh, the frequency range, is just how many different frequencies are found within each of the individual notes. So we can see from the happy that um, the range of frequencies was greater, like from there to there. But the sad version had a greater number of frequencies at a higher intensity. Yeah, so when you play a note, um, it's never going to be a perfectly pure pitch because that doesn't really happen in nature unless you have a computer program or whatever. So um, this just measures the different range or the range in each note. And then highest frequency is related to the frequency range, but it just finds the highest frequency fr highest frequency in each note. So um, this shows that the happy notes had um, overall a higher highest frequency than the same note in the sad piece. Okay, longest excursion is a little bit difficult to explain, but with all the frequencies in each different note, um, longest excursion is basically measuring the amount of time that it took to change frequencies. So for the happy, you can see that it didn't change very much, or... Yeah, yeah the pitch was pretty steady. Yeah, it was pretty steady. With the sad, it goes down um, so it took some time to change the pitch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so standard deviation is what we did to, com um, to be able to see which factors were most 
prominent in the different emotions. So it's a way, um, we use this to, I mean, since every factor that we measured had a different variable and a different range, we use this to be able to compare them all on the same scale. So the professor we worked with, he was talking about, or he used an analogy to, um, if you're measuring the height of basketball players and little people, um, for the basketball players, you can have one person that's seven feet, and then you could have another person that's five, uh, six feet or whatever. Um, but you're not going to have like a three-foot person, then also a two-foot person. So this just lets us um, adjust the range and the variables and stuff so we can compare them all together. And so using this, we found that the happy versions of the songs had a longer duration, a higher frequency range, a higher, highest frequency, but a, lo um, a shorter, longest excursion. Okay, so then the discriminant analysis was a way that we um, tested if my recordings also, like the factors in my recordings were also, um, they also showed up in Monica's recordings. So basically the computer takes um, whatever... It takes the first variable. Yeah, and then it tests, it compares, it, it uses mine to um, try to predict the emotion of the second recordings. Right, and so, like in this first example, um, using Ben's recordings, only 38% of my recordings were able to be classified the same way. And as we add more variables, the percentage that is the same between the two different musicians increases. Yeah, and 73% is actually very accurate because lie detectors, it uses a similar method. Um, and what they have less than 50% accuracy, so you'd be more accurate flipping a coin to guess if they're lying than using some of the lie detectors that they use. So that's pretty good. Okay. All right, so in conclusion, um, there were 27% of that wasn't able to be classified. And we assume this is because there are a lot of factors in the music that we didn't test for. And um, yeah. Yeah, and then um, the point of our project was to compare the physical aspects to the musical um, aspects of the sound. So vibrato is a really important one because when we were playing, we felt like we added a lot of vibrato to the sad songs just to make it more expressive and then not as much to the happy. And this was shown because um, the happy ones had a higher frequency range but a lower longest excursion, which meant that the range of the vibrato was more, but the, I guess, frequency, like how fast the vibrato was going, um, was a lot less in the um, happy slower, version. Yeah, it was slower. Vibrato. Okay, um, we were thinking of doing like a continuation of this next semester, and the things that we were wanting to explore next time were um, like inc an increased number of musicians and songs, maybe trying different instruments. Um, we could work on different emotions, like intense or angry or something like that. Um, looking for other features besides the four that we found to be relevant. And um, surveying people to see how they were actually perceiving the music. And he, um, the professor we were working with said he has a program where he can artificially increase the different factors and see if it actually changes how people are perceiving it. Yeah, and we also just wanted to make sure that, I mean, since this was only us playing two different songs on the trumpet, we wanted to see if the same factors applied to all of the different types of music instead of just the ones that we played. And we'd like to thank Dr. Mitch Summers for helping us a lot yeah. in this lab, because yeah. we were working with him. Very good. Thank you, guys.